today we're looking at uh, 50 of the most common uh, bird species in Yarra Ranges. Um, and I'm honoured to have uh, Chris with us, who is the host. Uh, and he told me this morning he's got 50 years of bird watching experience. Um, and he also runs a company uh, that does tours for uh, birds and he has some amazing photos. So welcome, Chris. Hello. Wonderful to have you here. Thanks very much. Let me begin by saying thank you to all those people who have logged on. Sarah assures me that some people have logged on and I'm not just talking to myself. So thanks very much for that. If I look a little bit ragged around the edges, it's because I only got home at 1.30 this morning. I've been twitching. So non-birders think that all bird watchers are twitchers. But in fact, twitchers are people who travel usually long distances to see a rare bird that someone else has found in some other part of the country in which they live in. And so recently, a, a bird that had not been seen on the, uh, in Australia very often, a, a few had been claimed from Northwestern Australia, but it had, they'd, they'd not been photographed or accepted well. So uh, this Nordman's Greenshank turned up on the Esplanade at Cairns in far North Queensland recently. And because of COVID restrictions, uh, it, it just recently was able to travel there. So on uh, Thursday morning, I got the six o'clock flight up to Cairns and at 10.30 in the morning, I managed to find the bird uh, and this is it. You'll see the very broad base to the bill, which is one of the best identification features for this species. Uh, so I was very pleased that I was able to get it so quickly. It's uh, a new bird to my Australian list. This bird breeds in Siberia and I've seen it on its wintering grounds in Hong Kong and in Thailand. So it's overshot its wintering grounds and turned up in Northern Australia. So because I allowed myself two days, so that meant that, that yesterday on the Friday, I was able to go bird watching. So I went bird watching in the lowland rainforest that surrounds Cairns and I was able to track down the most beautiful bird in those rainforests, the buff-breasted paradise kingfisher, and I even got a good photograph of it, which is very difficult to do. Eat your heart out, Raj. Sorry, Raj is a bird watching bird photography friend of mine, and uh, he's never seen this species. He's just a new boy on the block, but don't tell him I said that. And then I caught a flight yesterday uh, evening and uh, got into Tullamarine Airport at midnight and then drove home. So now I'll start the presentation that, that I'm supposed to be doing is the 50 most common birds in the Yarra Ranges. There was no point in me doing a webinar on the 50 least common birds in the Yarra Ranges. So by choosing the most common ones, they're birds that any of you can see if you went for a walk in the bush. All the photographs that I'm going to share with you, the 50 photographs, were all taken by myself and they were all taken with a $250 camera. I'll talk more about the camera later, but what I'm trying to make the point is that many bird photographers have cameras and telephoto lenses that cost thousands of dollars, but you actually can get very good results these days with uh, less, far less expensive cameras. Mine was only $250 five years ago. They're called bridge cameras and all the camera manufacturers make a kind of bridge camera. A little bit of uh, background information on myself. By now you have worked out uh, that, that I'm from England, from Northern England. And um, I emigrated out to uh, Australia. I arrived on April Fool's Day. 1973, mum, dad, and six children. And we were the last of the 10 pound palms. So this is a photograph taken about 25, 30 years ago. It's, um, I'm ship's ornithologist on a ship. This is in uh, the uh, Stanley Harbor in the Falkland Islands. And uh, I made a living of being ship's ornithologist or so pointing out birds to people on the ship when we traveled from Ushuaia in southern Argentina down to Antarctica and back again. 
my interest in birds started when I was a small boy in England. Uh, we were walking in the countryside when my mother showed me a European robin and I was very pleased to see it. And I said to my mother, I thought there was only sparrows and starlings. And she said, no, there's lots of different species of birds in Britain. And the following day, I went to the library and got a book out called uh, The Observer's Book of British Birds. Uh, and later, uh, when I'd saved up my meager pocket money, I was able to buy a copy of the book. I now have hundreds of bird books and I still have that copy, the first bird book, that I ever bought. This, um, this is my father with his five sons. I'm the twin on the right in, in the foreground, the good looking twin. Um, my twin brother is just a cheap copy. Uh, but my father used to say to people, I've got five sons, four sportsmen and a bloody bird watcher. So I got a lot of encouragement off my dad. He didn't like me being a bird watcher. I have operated a company called Peregrine Bird Tours for the last 36 years, and uh, I lead bird watching tours literally all over the world. And also I do tours within Australia, and I also bring in overseas bird watching groups and take them on tours around Australia. Um, I have seen over 8,100 uh, species of birds in the world and I've seen over 840 species of birds in Australia and its territories and one of the few people in the world who have had field experience with representatives of all 252 bird families in the world. So this is the camera I use to take the 50 photographs I'm going to show you. So it's a Canon SX50 HS and it's a very, very good camera. So we do, uh, please type in your questions that you want me to answer at the end of the talk and please make sure they're very easy questions so that I can answer them. So let's start with the uh, three different habitats within the Yarra Ranges Shire. First of all, there's suburbia. Secondly, there's farmland which probably makes up the bulk of the habitat in the Shire. And thirdly, and most importantly, is forest. And throughout the Shire, it's wet sclerophyll forest. And this is where most of the native species of birds can be found within the Shire. So we're gonna start on the 50 most commonest birds now. So the little pied cormorant is the smallest of the five species of the cormorants that occur in Australia, and it's equally at home along the coast or on inland lakes and farm dams. Obviously, I can't say too much about each species because I've got 50 species to, to get through. The white-faced heron is particularly fond of perching on fence posts and in trees, something which other members of the heron and egrets family don't normally do unless they're nesting in trees. The maned duck is common on farm dam, dams throughout the Shire, and it's the missing link between geese and ducks. It has the body of a duck, but it has the bill of a goose. And like geese, it feeds from grazing grass. And so it is the missing link between ducks and geese. The Pacific black duck is a familiar bird in the Shire. It's found on lakes, and farm dams. And when it's in <clears throat> lakes where members of the public can go to, it becomes very tame as this particular bird was. The spotted dove is introduced from India. It's particularly common in the suburbs, which is where most introduced birds live. Uh, and, and this is, is, is very common uh, throughout the Shire. The, Common bronzewing is a ground feeding large species of pigeon. And for some reason, it's particularly common in the Mount Evelyn region. The Gangan cockatoo is an altitudinal migrant. So it breeds during the summer months in the high mountains. And then when the winter comes, it migrates 
to a lower altitude, such as the suburbs of Melbourne. It has a, 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 a very uh, peculiar call, and once you've learned the call, you'll never forget it. The galah is probably a bird that um, we're all familiar with, but it's only invaded uh, into the Shire in the last 30 years. 30 years ago, this species was unknown in the Melbourne area, but it's moved in over the last 30 years as now incredibly common. It is a, a member of the cockatoo family and a particularly beautiful bird. Recently, I did a, a three week tour along the east coast of Australia for a Scottish bird watching group and the Scottish bird tour leader voted this as the, his most favorite bird of the tour. Because it is a very beautiful bird, but because it's now so common, we take it for granted. The long-billed Corella is now very common in the Shire. And again, 30 years ago, it, it was never here. Um, and 30 years ago, it, it was only found in a very small area of Western Victoria, and that was its wo total world distribution. But in the last 30 years, its population has exploded and has spread. It's now found throughout Victoria and through the Riverina areas of New South Wales. A similar story with this Corella, the little Corella is now very common throughout the Shire, but 30 years ago, it was unknown in the Melbourne area. If you wanted to see this bird prior to 30 years ago, you had to go up into the Mallee in the northwest of Victoria in order to see this bird. The sulfur crested cockatoo is a bird that we're probably all familiar with. It's a very attractive species. It's the only large white cockatoo in the world that is still common. All other large white cockatoos throughout the world, which mainly occur in Asia, have all been trapped for the cage bird trade, and now they're all very rare as a direct consequence of trapping for the cage bird trade. So we're very fortunate to have uh, such a large cockatoo as a common bird where we live. The rainbow lorikeet is another bird that has colonized uh, the Shire in the last 30 years. 30 years ago, they were not in the Melbourne area, but um, now it's particularly common. It can often be seen screeching noisily overhead as it flies over and it feeds on nectar. The crimson rosella is another very familiar bird and common bird in the Shire. It's a bit of a trap for beginner bird watchers because it starts its life off as an immature bird. It's all green and then gradually molts into adult crimson plumage as the bird gets older. The eastern rosella is another beautiful parrot that's common in the Shire. And when it flies, it has a very undulating flight. That is that it, that it flies like this. The Australian king parrot uh, is becoming increasingly common in the Shire. And there's a big difference between males and females. This is a male bird, which has a red head and female birds have green heads. This beautiful bird is the fantailed cuckoo. Fantailed cuckoo. It is a summer migrant to Victoria and it spends the winter months in Northern Queensland and New Guinea. Like most species of cuckoos, it is nest parasitic. That is, it lays its eggs in other birds' nests and lets them rear them and they become the foster parents. The shining bronze cuckoo is similar to the previous species in that it is also a summer migrant to Victoria and is nest parasitic. They mainly lay their eggs in the nests of fairy wrens, um, scrub wrens and thornbills. And what happens is when the cuckoo hatches in the nests of the other birds, it throws out the eggs or young birds of that nest. So it's the sole bird left in the nest and the, 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 the 
uh, thornbill or scrub wren becomes become the foster parents for that cuckoo. The laughing kookaburra is a species that we're probably all familiar with. It is one of the largest species of kingfishers in the world, but like most Australian kingfishers, it has abandoned its fish ca catching uh, role and now feeds mainly on snakes and lizards. And I've actually seen them eating large rats. Um, we all know that it's quite partial to sausages at barbecues. The welcome swallow is another common bird throughout the Shire. Its numbers increase dramatically during the summer months when birds from Northern Australia come down to spend the summer months in Victoria. The black-faced cuckoo shrike is another summer migrant, only comes here during the summer months. And this bird has a peculiar habit of reshuffling its wings when it alights on a branch. The common blackbird is an introduced species, was introduced from England. It, has, it is particularly common in parks and gardens. It also has a beautiful song, which wakes me up every morning. The willy wagtail is a common bird throughout the Shire. It's a member of the fantail flycatcher family and it's called wagtail because the early migrants from England, the pioneers that arrived here, uh, they thought it looked a little bit like wagtails in England. Uh, it really doesn't look very much like the wagtails in England, but that's how it gets the name. The grey fantail is also a member of the fantail flycatcher family and uh, this bird I photographed is collecting nesting material. It builds a champagne glass type nest uh, where it rears two small young. The Eastern Yellow Robin is another beautiful bird that's common throughout the forests of the Shire. It's a very inquisitive bird. Uh, if it hears you or sees you, it will often come close to see what you're doing. The Australian Golden Whistler. You'll notice I didn't call it a Golden Whistler because recently the Golden Whistler has been split into 11 different species of birds occurring from New Guinea all the way down into the Pacific Islands. And so there are now 11 species of golden whistlers and the one that occurs, occurs in Australia is now called the Australian golden whistler. It has very slow and deliberate movements as it searches for insects in, in the trees. The grey shrike thrush is one of the best songsters we have, has a beautiful song and can be found feeding from the forest floor right up to the canopy. The eastern whip bird. This bird is easily heard but is extremely difficult to see and almost impossible to photograph. So I was particularly pleased with this photograph because it is such a very difficult bird to photograph. It has a very large whip call, which some of us will be familiar with. The superb fairy wren is a common bird in the Shire. And this is a male in full breeding plumage. And during the non-breeding season in the winter months, young males molt into uh, an all brown and gray plumage like the females. But adult males of four years and older, they retain breeding plumage throughout the whole year. The white browed scrub wren is the commonest bird in the Shire that frequents the forest floor and is often the victim of cuckoos. The brown thornbill is one of the commonest birds in the forest. It's actually a very good mimic 
and can mimic the calls of many other birds. The striated thornbill is a closely related species, but this species occurs in flocks, whereas the brown thornbill only occurs in family groups. And this species feeds in the canopy, therefore avoiding competition with the brown thornbill, which normally is found from ground level to about three meters high. Now, obviously you can get a striated thornbill that will come down low and you can get a brown thornbill that goes up higher than normal. But as a rule of thumb, uh, they don't compete with each other because they feed at different elevations within the forest. The white-throated tree creeper is another common bird of the forested areas. You can see it climbing up the trunks of trees where it searches vigorously at every nook and cranny searching for spiders and insects. The spotted pardalote is one of the smallest birds in Australia, but I think you'll agree with me, it's also one of the most beautiful birds in Australia. It feeds on lerp. Lerp is a scale insect that lives on the underside of leaves. So if you find this bird, you will often see it hanging upside down, feeding on something on the underside of the leaf. And this is lerp. It also feeds on mistletoe berries. And so it eats the mistletoe. And then when it defecates, it leaves the seeds on the branch and there will become mistletoe. So it spreads mistletoe throughout the forest. Each winter, thousands of birds leave Tasmania and come to winter in mainland Australia from Victoria all the way to southern Queensland. The peachy buffy flanks of this particular bird tell me that it is of the Tasmanian race. The yellow-faced honeyeater is a very noisy honey eater with a very loud call and it's normally the commonest honey eater in the forest within the Shire. The white-eared honey eater has been recorded plucking fair from a sleeping kangaroo repeatedly in order to line the nest with the kangaroo fair. White-naped honey eater is a, a honey eater that lives in flocks in the canopy of the forest and feeds on both nectar and insects. The New Holland honey eater is a familiar bird. It's very pugnacious and, and uh, a, a bit of a bully, chasing other birds off that comes into its territory. They normally live in loose flocks. And um, when I get um, Austra uh, Dutch bird watching groups coming into Australia, where I take them around Australia, or occasionally I'll get a Dutchman in a British bird watching group, they always ask at the beginning of the tour, Chris, do you think it would be possible to show me a new Holland honey eater? I tell them that it's very rare, which is not, it's very common, but I tell them it's very rare. And then when we find a group and I show them to them, they say, Chris, but you told me it was rare. And I said, I'm, I'm pulling your leg, but they don't understand what pulling your leg means. The Eastern Spinebill is another species of honey eater and uh, it, it feeds predominantly on nectar and it doesn't mind whether the nectar is supplied by a native plant or whether it's an introduced plant, it feeds on both. The bell miner is a, a very aggressive species of honey eater that lives in flocks. Unfortunately, on a nationwide scale, uh, it's not doing very well. And many of the colonies are just simply disappearing. It's often referred to as the bellbird. The noisy miner is another very aggressive honey eater and uh, lives in loose flocks and has benefited from white man 
coming to Australia because it likes to live in open areas along the edge of forest. And because when uh, white people came, they started chopping down forested areas, this bird has benefited greatly from uh, European settlement. The red wattle bird is the largest wattle bird on mainland Australia. There is one larger species of honey eater, but it is endemic to Tasmania and it is the yellow wattle bird. Uh, this bird, the red wattle bird, is a very common bird of gardens and parkland within the Shire. The magpie lark uh, feeds on the ground, and you'll often see it foraging on the ground. It builds a mud nest, and there are only two members of uh, uh, two species uh, of, of these type of birds in the family. The other one is the torrent lark, which is only found in New Guinea, and it frequents fast flowing mountain streams. The dusky wood swallow is another summer migrant to Victoria, where they nest in loose flocks. And if a kookaburra or a pied currawong approaches too closely to a nest, all the birds will, all the dusky wood swallows in the area will attack that bird on unison. The grey butcher bird has one of the loveliest songs in Australia. It's a common bird of um, the uh, parkland and gardens in the Melbourne area, for example, and it feeds mainly on lizards and insects. The Pied Currawong is a, a familiar bird within the shower. It's also an altitudinal migrant. That is that it breeds high up in the mountains during the summer months. And then in the winter months, it descends to lower altitude. And for example, the suburbs of Melbourne, uh, where, where it uh, becomes very common. Uh, it is unfortunately a nest robber and uh, feeds on eggs and nest that it, uh, sorry, feeds on eggs and young birds that it finds in the nests of other birds. It, it, it is estimated that um, there are a million pied currawongs living in southeastern Australia. The Australian magpie is another common bird that we're all familiar with, likes to feed in open areas surrounded by woodland. <clears throat> and here in, uh, here in the Shire, we have the most attractive race of Australian magpie that occurs in Australia. The further north you get, the smaller they get and the less white they have in their plumage. The little raven, is another very common bird within the Shire. It lives in flocks and feeds and, and frequents farmland. It is very similar to the Australian raven, but Australian raven only occurs in forest and only in family groups. Therefore, you have two very similar species, but they don't compete against each other because they're found in two different habitats. This is the common miner, an introduced species, introduced from India, and to many birders, it is public enemy number one. I find that most of these birds nest in buildings and not in holes in trees, although I have seen uh, a few nesting in holes in trees. Most nest in buildings uh, and so do not compete too much with native species. I find that the following species, the common starling, is far more of a threat to Australian birds because it very readily feeds in holes in trees. In fact, a few years ago, I had a pair of eastern rosellas nesting in a hole in a tree in my garden, and they were forced out by this bird 
the common starling. So I find this far more of a menace than the common miner. And the common starling is one of the few birds in the world that looks better in winter plumage than in summer plumage. And this bird is in its winter plumage. So I invite you to come on a bird walk with myself and you can express areas of interest uh, on the Shire website. Uh, I'd love to go birding with you and uh, show you some of the birds that occur in the Shire. And that's the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And um, uh, we'll now go to uh, questions and I hope you've made them easy for me. And uh, Sarah will read out some of your questions. So thanks very much for signing in and for listening to me regarding the 50 commonest birds in the Shire, in the Yarra Ranges Shire. Uh, thank you, Chris. That was that was wonderful. Uh, your um, your expertise on birds is amazing. Um, you've got uh, there's quite a lot of questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so some of them are similar. So I might just group some of them together. Um, but uh, here we go. So please just keep them coming. Just and we'll answer as many as we possibly can. Um, so a couple of days ago, people have asked, um, what are some methods of controlling uh, for cockatoos attacking fruit trees um, that are acceptable and recommended? Okay, well, all cockatoos are native birds to Australia, so they're all officially protected. So you cannot harm or hinder any species of cockatoos. Um, there is a paper written on uh, how to best control cockatoos and uh, I just have it in front of me here. So you can download it off the internet. It's called Guidelines for Reducing Cockatoo Damage and it's put out by the Victorian state government. And what they recommend, well, netting is the obvious answer to uh, net the fruit you're trying to protect. Uh, also, there are um, uh, machines you can buy that uh, sound like a shotgun going off, which you can put close by, and this does have some effect. Um, also, uh, you can get uh, buy off the internet uh, large cutouts of birds of prey and put those uh, around the area you're trying to protect from cockatoos. And um, it, there is evidence that uh, cockatoos shy away when they see these uh, pretend birds of prey. Um, and uh, an another method that is legal uh, is that you can put uh, um, electric shock perches in the area, but I think that's uh, getting a little bit dramatic. But anyway, if, if you really want to find out uh, download it off the website. It's called Guidelines for Reducing Cockatoo Damage. Okay. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, when we send out our, um, you know, our email at the end of this webinar, we might just put together a couple of these resources too. Um, but someone has asked, um, so just in general, what birds should we be encouraging and what birds should we be discouraging in our house, houses? Uh, and just how do we do that? Well, uh, uh, you don't have to uh, you don't have to uh, attract the introduced species; they will naturally be there. But I think that you should be trying to attract native birds into your garden, and the way to do that is to plant native trees, particularly uh, ones that are, uh, have uh, nectar bearing. Uh, properties so that uh, birds that are nectar feeders will come into your garden. So I'm talking about banksias, grevilleas, native species uh, that give off nectar. That's the best way of attracting native species into your garden. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Um, and some people might want to put um, smaller species in. So there's smaller types of grevillea that you can put in if you don't have a big garden space. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, 
So we've got about 40 questions. So, <laughs> all right. So someone has said thank you for the session. It's been wonderful. Um, so did the I paid them. I paid them to say that. I paid them, yeah. So someone has said, uh, did the bushfires and COVID, has that had an effect on birds that we're seeing locally? I don't think COVID's had. Uh, bushfires obviously uh, affect birds adversely. Um, we, we, it's, it's not, the birds in the Shire are not badly affected by uh, bushfires, but I think birds in Central Australia, for example, are doing it extremely tough at the moment due to, clo uh, to, to climate warming uh, or global warming. Um, uh, bushfires are becoming more frequent in, in Central Australia and more severe. Uh, and given chance, the birds will, will breed up and recover. But when these uh, droughts and bushfires become more frequent and more severe, the birds don't have a chance to recover. So I've noticed in, in the um, um, 40 years I've been living in Australia that the birds in, in the outback uh, are really struggling and are really down in numbers. And I'm not sure that they'll ever recover because of uh, the frequency of uh, bushfires. And um, <clears throat> places like Kakadu National Park, for example, are um, nowhere near as good as when the park first opened for birds because uh, it's burnt far too frequently. Um, uh, and it often burnt during the nesting season, uh, which just seems crazy to me, but it, it happens all the time. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so the same person has also asked um, what type of binoculars should they invest in to enhance their bird watching experience? Okay, well, uh, th there's two types of binoculars. There's the old fashioned type and then there's a modern binoculars that are called roof prism binoculars. Uh, you should buy a roof prism and there should be the magnification should be either eight by 40 or 10 by 40. So you want 840 or 1040 roof prisms. I happen to, uh, I'm a binocular broker and I source uh, very good quality binoculars from China, bring them into Australia and sell them at ridic ridiculously inexpensive prices. So if you're looking to purchase a new binocular, ring me first. Okay, thank you. Um, so someone's asked about, have you, I think you kind of touched on this before, have you observed changes in uh, birds, bird migratory patterns that have accompanied uh, changes in climate? No, I don't think there's been a change in, 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 in uh, migratory patterns. They've remained the same. I notice a decrease in the number of uh, migrants coming into Australia. Um, let's just take migratory waders, for example, the numbers have dropped dramatically. And that's because areas along the flyway where they migrate and where they stop and feed up uh, are being drained, such as um, in China uh, and in South Korea, uh, swamps where these birds would stop, rest and feed up are being drained. And so birds are uh, losing uh, these areas and uh, are, are dying because of it. So uh, I'm noticing a, a great reduction in numbers of migratory species and also just a general reduction in birds uh, in Australia during the 40 years I've lived here and particularly small species of birds seem to be struggling and we did have a, a drought for 10 years in Australia not long ago and uh, many birds are not back to the levels that they were prior to that long drought. Thank you. Um, this is actually a really interesting question and a few people have asked this. Um, you were touching on, you know, what, what is the main reason why the Corellas and the Galahs have um, moved into Melbourne over the last 30 years and why not earlier? Well, what, one of the reasons is drought. Uh, drought conditions make birds move and um, because uh, since, since uh, uh, 
Europeans colonize Australia, then they chop down forests, they make open areas, far more open areas now than there was originally. And also they put in farm dams. And these farm dams means that birds can move uh, uh, easily from place to place and survive because of farm dams. And species like cockatoos, for example, uh, can expand their range due to uh, having readily water available in farm dams and um, more open areas that they like. Um, the big flocks of cockatoos and corellas are birds of open areas and there's far more open areas now uh, than there was originally. And these birds are, are spreading throughout the open areas because of it. Mm, interesting. Um... So someone has said, what, what is a, a species that has kept you up at night that you have not yet seen? <laughs> well, there's only two species of birds I haven't seen in Australia. So there's the night parrot, and which has only recently been rediscovered, and the um, western ground parrot, which has just recently been split into two species. Um, so I, I, I really don't... Uh, I, uh, there, there aren't many, there was hardly any birds in Australia I haven't seen and having seen over 8,000 species of birds in the world, um, there's really nothing that, I, that, that I, I, I would be particularly keen to see. I, I, having seen representatives of every family of birds in the world, something I haven't seen is just a sort of slight variation on something that I have seen. But I'm always very keen to see new birds, don't get me wrong. Um, I, I love to find new birds, but I, I'm, I, I equally enjoy showing other people birds that they haven't seen before. And I'm very keen to, to um, help beginner birders uh, to, be, to be better birders. I think that's why um, I will try and set up, um, yeah, a bird walk soon. I think people will love it. Um, so what are your thoughts on feeding local magpies? Um, and if you support it, what's okay to feed them and what's not okay to feed them? Yeah, um, I know many people feed magpies and I have friends that feed magpies as well. It doesn't seem to do them any harm, uh, but um, feeding any native species of bird or mammal can have problems in that the birds become very tame and unafraid of humans. Uh, it's probably not such a problem in magpies, but certainly um, feeding kangaroos uh, is, is not a good idea because they lose their fear of humans and can become quite aggressive to humans. Um, feeding cassowaries, for example, uh, is not a good idea because the day they come looking for food and you don't have any, they're likely to attack you, which happened to a friend of mine in Mission Beach a few years ago. Um, emus that uh, are fed by humans also lose their fear of humans uh, and can become very aggressive and attack. So by and large, I think it's probably better not to uh, feed native birds and mammals. Certainly don't feed them bread. Uh, don't feed ducks bread. Um, uh, and generally the, the consensus these days is, is not to feed them at all. Mm. I have to um, remember that because I think my son feeds them. <laughs> Um, so someone said that they often hear birds, um, but they can't see them. All right, just, just sorry, just just a, just a further thought on, on bird, feeding birds. In the United States of America, uh, feeding birds is a multi-million dollar industry, and they put out food mainly in winter for birds. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that birds would die during the winter months. They have much more severe winters than we do. Birds would die during the winter months if it wasn't for the food put out to them on bird feeding tables in suburban gardens throughout the United States. So there it's a, it's a good thing to feed the birds, particularly in winter. And it's not such a good idea here. Okay, thank you. Um, so just someone has said that they hear birds, um, but they often don't see them. Can you recommend a good resource on bird calls? 
for Yarra Rangers? Um, <clears throat> there are apps that you, you can uh, download onto your phone which have uh, bird calls uh, for any area of Australia, bird calls of Victoria, bird calls for the whole of Australia. They're inexpensive apps that you can download. And if you're hearing a bird but can't see it, it just takes practice. Um, and, and, and if you you're, can hear a bird but you can't see it, just change where you're standing, may, maybe by a couple of metres, and that can give you a different angle and uh, may, may enable you to see the bird where you couldn't see it from where you were originally standing because there was it was behind a leaf or there was a branch in the way or something like that. But really, the, the best way is to practice, 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 and um, soon you get very good at finding birds. Great. The um, other thing, just let me make one further comment. Um, um, seasoned bird watchers will learn bird calls so that when they're put in a forest, they're listening with their ears what species are calling. So they know what, the, what birds are present because of their calls. They don't have to look at them. You can take me in a forest and blindfold me. I'll tell you what birds are in the forest because I've learned the bird calls. It, 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 doesn't come easily to most people to learn and remember bird calls. If you have a musical ear, apparently it's far easier for you to remember and retain bird calls than someone like myself who's tone deaf. But uh, I have managed to learn bird calls throughout Australia, uh, but it hasn't come easy to me. It's something that I've had to work at. Thank you for that. Um... So someone's just asked, um, is there a book, a bird book, uh, or a, a poster of local birds uh, for Yarra Rangers? Hmm. Um, there is a book um, on birds of the Yarra Ranges and where to find them. Um, uh, it, by Peter Mason. It's probably out of print, but you, you can find it if you look for it. And often it's in secondhand bookshops. Um, but there are lots of uh, half a dozen field guides on the birds of Australia that you can purchase. Um, and, and they have every bird in Australia. So you, if you're looking at a bird, it's going to be in that field guide. You've just got to work out which one you're looking at. And, it, and you're better to learn the <laughs> plumages beforehand rather than looking a bird opening the field guide and trying to find it although at the beginning that's what you're going to have to do anyway um, we're fortunate to live in Australia in that we have lots of different species of birds and um, most of them are quite easy to identify of all the continents in the world the easiest continent to identify birds is Australia and somewhere like uh, uh, Britain has uh, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the largest uh, birding organization in Britain, has over a million members. And uh, bird watching is, a, is the second commonest hobby behind fishing in, uh, in Great Britain. And yet the birds there are nowhere near as plentiful as they are here in Australia and nowhere near as colorful. And so I think it's a great shame that more Australians aren't interested in, in, in observing their native bird life because bird watching is a tremendous hobby and you can do it to whatever level you want. You can just watch birds in your back garden. You can just watch birds in the Melbourne area or you can do what I do and travel all around the world and, and watch birds um, in the Amazon basin uh, or, or on the savannah grasslands of Africa. So birding you can do to whatever level you want to do it. That's the great thing about bird watching. I find it very relaxing and calming actually to watch birds. No, I, I, I find it so as well though. So, um, it it can become competitive. There's actually, I think there's a um, Birds of Victoria. Um, so along with that information, the binoculars and the camera details, we'll actually send that out with the follow-up email. Good. Don't have to worry about that one. So someone's um, asked that you didn't mention anything about raptors, which includes like eagles, hawks, kites, powerful owls. Um, are they in decline? 
Um, I don't think any of them rate in the commonest 50 birds in, in the uh, Yarrow Ranges Shire. That's why I didn't mention them. But it's a good question. And uh, undoubtedly, um, birds of prey numbers in Australia are, have dropped uh, very noticeably, say, in the last 20 years. Uh, nowhere near the numbers of uh, raptors around, say, the Melbourne area that they used to be. And, and e even uh, anywhere in Australia, raptor numbers uh, uh, have dropped a lot. Um, but having said that, uh, if I went bird watching in the Melbourne area, I, I would be disappointed if I didn't see uh, three or four different species of raptors on a, a morning's outing. In fact, um, uh, in the suburbs of Melbourne, during the COVID lockdown, when I wasn't allowed to travel very far, uh, I've been doing more local bird watching, and I've actually found a, a very rare raptor uh, nesting in the suburbs of Melbourne in the, in the Shire of Yarrow Ranges and uh, they very successfully raised two young birds which, which uh, uh, flew the nest and uh, they've never been recorded uh, breeding in Melbourne before. So they are, they are out there, the numbers have decreased but they're still uh, uh, quite easily to find if, if, if you know where to look. Great. Um, why do rainbow lorikeets, who are nectar eaters, eat uh, bird seed from bird feeders? Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. In the wild, they, they feed on uh, a nectar, but they will readily take to seeds as well. And um, in fact, even, even in the uh, in the wild that they, they will feed on seeds as well, although they predominantly feed on nectar. And they can uh, sometimes show signs of being drunk uh, or intoxicated. And, and what they've been doing is feeding on nectar that's sort of uh, past its use by date. And they, it makes them uh, disorientated. Sorry about that, I keep on having to take my mute on and off because there's a dog barking. <laughs> um, so someone's just asked again about how do you become familiar with the bird calls um, and will you email this list? I'm just going to say that we're going to email this list of uh, birds out to everyone. Um, okay, well, um, like I said, you can uh, readily download apps on your telephone which have the bird calls. And then uh, I know some bird watchers that when they're driving around in the car, they they have it on so that they're learning the bird calls as, as they're driving around. Rather than having music coming out of their radio, which is what most people do when they drive a vehicle, uh, they have bird calls and it, it's one way of learning them. Um, that's actually a really clever idea, really clever. Um, so the, the birds that you listed um, in random order or you know, were they? No, they were in taxonomic order. Uh, so taxonomists, people who, who, who uh, decide what is a species, what is a subspecies, what is a race, uh, they put them in a particular order, uh, which was uh, put, uh, first put together by a Swedish ornithologist called Linnaeus in the um, 1700s. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a good way of doing it, but it's, it's it's certainly not the, the, the uh, uh, be all and end all. And in fact, very recently, the International Ornithologist Congress has put out a new checklist of the birds of the world in a, an entirely different taxonomic order. The reason I did it this way was because most bird watchers are familiar with the slightly older uh, classification. Uh, which is radically different from the new one. Thank you for that. Um, we might mention that in the, um, the summary as well. Okay, so someone has talked about uh, planting natives to attract uh, nectar feeders. Yep. Um, if you plant large uh, grevilleas, showy grevilleas, um, you will attract noisy miners. Yeah, correct. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, correct. Yeah, the larger the, the grevillea you plant, the larger the birds will come into it. And, and what they will do is they'll protect that feeding source. So if smaller species of honey eaters come in, they'll chase them away. So, so that person's quite correct. Um, you're probably better off putting in smaller species of grevillea. Are you Recently, there was a big influx of scarlet honey eaters into Melbourne. And it was very interesting that there was um, uh, two different plants involved. Um, and uh, the big honey eaters were in the larger plants and the small honey eaters, like the scarlet honey eaters, were in the smaller plants. Do you have any recommendations of certain types of, of plants? Uh, Grevilleas, Banksias, Spinebills, for example, like fuchsias, which is an introduced species. You're probably better off uh, planting native species. Um, again, just go online. Um, there are articles online that tell you which species, which native species to plant in your garden to attract native birds. Okay, great. Uh, someone suggested that we could create a Twitter's uh, Facebook page for Daniel Rangers um, so that people could share their insights and learn from each other. Is I, there I, anything already I, like that? I'd never thought of thought about that, but I think it's an excellent idea that uh, we should have one for a local shire and then um, uh, we, we can discuss what's happening bird-wise within the shire. If a rare bird turns up, for example, we can tell, let people know where it is. Um, or if uh, something's happening in your area, so some changes or whatever that we could share it, I, I think it'd be uh, a great thing to do. We just need some um, IT boffin who uh, would be able to set it up for us. I'm, I'm sure there are uh, people out there within the Shire who are interested in IT and birds who could put it together for us. Not, not me, I'm not an IT buff. We can see maybe how much uh, interest there is after this and then sort of work it out. Um, so yeah. someone asked about um, if we would, uh, you know, I guess say you could hear bird calls as well, but you didn't have that in the talk. Yeah, I, I thought about it. I thought about maybe using it on particular species, but uh, in the end I, found, I decided it was just all too hard. But as I say, just, just download the app onto your telephone. They're, they're readily available and you'll have all the bird calls at your fingertips. Great. Um, is the Maine duck the same as the wood duck? Yes, Australian wood duck is another name for Maine duck. On the new IOC, so International Ornithologist Congress checklist, it's now back to Maine duck, uh, not Australian wood duck. So in, in the names I gave during my presentation, there were the names used on the new international world checklist. Perfect, thank you. Um, and where is the best place to go bird watching in the Yarra Ranges, in your opinion? Anywhere. Uh, um, I like Badger Creek Weir at Healesville. Uh, the Dandenong Ranges National Park is also a good bird, good place to go and look for birds. Any wetland area w within the Shire is, is worth looking at. Looking at. Uh, the Warburton Trail has actually got some very good birds that you can see from the Warburton Walking Trail. Great. Um, a couple of people have mentioned a book, uh, Birds of the Yarra Catchment and where to find them. Um, so I might just put that uh, up in the follow-up email as well. Yeah, that was the book I was alluding to earlier. Okay, fantastic. All right, um, okay. So someone said that they're disappointed that the tawny frog mouth did not appear. Why is that? Again, it, it's, 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 it wouldn't be in the top 50 birds um, in, the Shire. Um, it, it, is, it is a common bird. It, it, it's more common than people think. And uh, it, it's even a common bird throughout suburban Melbourne. Um, and 
look, it was difficult to, to narrow it down to 50 species. And it was just arbitrary on my behalf to try and scratch my brains and think, well, what are you most likely to see if you went for a bushwalk? And um, you, you're not likely to see a tony frogmouth if you just went on a, a random bushwalk. You might have a pair breeding in your garden, but if you went for a, a walk along um, uh, the tracks that say Badger Creek Weir at Healesville, you, you won't see one. Sorry, no, they're, you know, they're quite hard to spot. Um, so someone's asking about behaviour. They saw a magpie lying on its belly, wings spread out in the grass of their backyard, uh, not moving but awake. What is this behaviour? Uh, it, it, it's... It may be uh, that it's absorbing sun rays, that it's, it's warming up from the rays of the sun. It could be that they're anting. Sometimes they do that when they allow ants to, to crawl over the plumage and uh, pick out um, any things that shouldn't be there. Fantastic. Um, and what is the best time to go out and find birds? Uh, undoubtedly early morning. The birds are most active uh, and more easily seen in the first few, few hours of daylight. Uh, in the tropics, for example, nothing happens in the middle of the afternoon. It's absolutely dead. It, it, it's in cooler climates, it, it's not as marked, but anywhere you go, uh, there's a drop off in, in bird activity during the middle of the afternoon. So mornings is by far more productive than afternoons and if I was going to go bird watching for half a day it would always be in the morning rather than in uh, the evening so if you're a bird watcher you're going to have to get used to getting up early in the morning and when I have uh, introduced friends to bird watching uh, one of the things they're not particularly happy about sometimes is uh, that they have to get up early in the morning to go bird watching but it, it's far more rewarding far more productive in the early hours of the morning than in the late morning and certainly more productive than the afternoon. <laughs> People just don't like getting up. <laughs> um, so someone's made a comment here, um, just tell everyone not to feed mince meat to magpies. Uh, okay, right. Calcium. Yeah. Uh, someone's asked about, there's a pair of eagles in emerald in pairs. Um, yes. What species would they be and are they common? Well, they're probably referring to wedge-tailed eagles, uh, which are fairly common th throughout the area. And um, I live in Muralbark, which is a, an outer suburb of Melbourne, and uh, I see them occasionally through my office window. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're a fairly common species and widespread. And it's the third largest eagle in the world. So it, it is a very large species of eagle. Yes, it's huge. If you go out to uh, regional parts of Victoria, it's, yeah. you can see it. Uh, and it feeds, these days, it feeds mainly on rabbits. Wow, amazing. Um, someone's just asked about a good app for bird calls again, so we can uh, put that out in the um, follow-up email. Um, no. Field guides, it, it, um, some of the field guides to the birds of Australia uh, have an app for that particular field guide. I know uh, Morecambe's field guide has a, a, a bird call app that comes with it, and also you can download it online as well. Uh, so, so there's, yeah, I really can't recommend one. Um, I, I made all my own uh, recordings of, of bird calls and, and I use them, uh, but it's much easier to download one on your telephone. Yes. Uh, so someone's asked for, can we do another 50 something? Perhaps your favorite 50. <laughs> we might be, able, I've, I've, we've still got 64 questions. I I could I, I, I could do something like my 50, 50 best bird photographs from birds around the world. So that, that way you get a chance to see exotic birds from South America, from Africa, from Asia, from all over the world. It's something we could think about. Definitely, because as I said, there's still 
over 60 questions here. <laughs> um, people said uh, they love butcher birds, they're very pretty. Someone said, uh, thank you so much. We'd love to go walking, talking. That would be great. Another one's talked about uh, the app for the calls. Um, so that would be that would be really good. Um, someone said a good place to check this is um, Yarra Junction. All right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry, I'm just trawling through them all. There's so many. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, just let me say that um, the best bird watching spot around Melbourne but uh, not within the Shire, is the Western Treatment Plant at Werribee. Uh, is an excellent place for bird watching. Uh, you can see a hundred different species of birds in a day. That's in a very long full day in summer uh, at the Western Treatment Plant, but you do have to um, get a permit to visit the plant, but they're readily available. Just go onto the Western Treatment Plant Western Treatment Plant website and um, you have to do an introduction course uh, but it's fairly straightforward uh, but it is a, a marvellous place and we're very fortunate to have such an excellent wetland area so close to Melbourne. Yeah we are. Definitely. It is as good as any area in southern Australia. Oh that's wonderful to hear that. Um, someone said that they've seen a small blue kingfisher near the Yarra Ranger State Forest, uh, but their, their bird reference says that it's not in the area. Have you seen these around the Yarra Rangers? If, if it's near rivers or, or even small creeks, then it will be the azure kingfisher, which is an uncommon bird throughout the ranges. Uh, if, it's in, if, it, if it's deep in a forest, then it will be sacred kingfisher which uh, is a summer migrant to, to Victoria. Uh, and, uh, but but it, it, it mainly occurs in forest and azure kingfisher mainly occurs in wetlands and along rivers. Fantastic. Um, there's lots of people saying thank you so much for the presentation, that's really great. It's my pleasure. So I think we'll definitely have to do another one. Um, there's a great Indigenous nursery in the Shire, Karanga Nursery in York Road in Mount Evelyn. Yes, I was there just yesterday, a couple of yeah, days ago. Yeah, I've been there. Yes, it is, very, it is very good. Yes, I can endorse it also. Yes, in fact, I was there a few weeks ago and looking at some natives to plant in my garden and eastern spinebills were coming in to the nursery and, and, and feed, feeding on the nectar in the bushes. Yeah, definitely. I'm just going to go up to see what else I can find. Um, how common are the bowerbirds in, in the Yarra Ranges and what attracts them to the area? We have a resident in our garden. Uh, yeah, uh, so that will be the satin bowerbird. And um, it's not particularly common. It gets more common uh, to, towards Alinda and out that way uh, where it can be fairly numerous. Uh, but there are large parts of the Shire where it doesn't occur. Um, but uh, for example, at um, uh, the Yarra Dam area at um, Hillsville, they're, they're, they're quite common there. Uh, but there are other areas which the habitat looks exactly the same, but they don't occur. Uh, and, and who knows why that is. Um, I'm filming a video where I set up hidden cameras and record birds. Is there an easy way to attract birds into the view of the camera? <laughs> um, no, basically no. I, I, don't, I don't know of, uh, uh, of any way to do that. Um, no, no, I, I really don't know how how you would do that. I, I'm, I'm familiar with the, with the cameras and they're now inexpensive and, and uh, lots of people use them, particularly hunters uh, use them. Uh, but it's also of interest that no thylacines have ever been recorded on one and yet thylacines are claimed to be seen by people, but I think mainly on a Saturday evening walking home from the pub. <laughs> Um, so if someone wants to know what your favourite bird is, 
in the world or in Australia? Maybe both. Well, my favourite bird in the world is the Andean cock of the rock, which is, as the name would suggest, it occurs in the Andes Mountains of South America. And it was my favourite because when I was a young boy living in England, uh, my, uh, my family don't drink tea, and, but my grandfather did. And uh, it, it, in this particular brand of tea, they put in cards of birds. So in each packet, there was a, 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 a card with a bird depicted on it and he would save them for me. So uh, I went to his home every Friday evening where I had dinner with him and uh, he would give me some of the cards he'd collected. And one day, one of the cards he gave me was of a uh, an Andean cock of the rock and I said to him one day granddad I'm going to go and see that bird uh, and that's the bird I most want to see in the world and it, it was even as an adult and um, the first time that I saw it or oh, about 30 years ago now I was just ecstatic to see it it's a very beautiful uh, very strange looking species so that's my favorite species in the world I never get tired of looking at it and I think my favorite species in Australia would be waders in general. So that a family of birds called waders. These are birds that uh, uh, mainly, uh, are mainly migratory, uh, breed in Siberia. And then when winter hits uh, Siberia, uh, they, the, the ground becomes frozen, they have no choice but to migrate south and many of them come to Australia and that's certainly my favorite family of birds. They're also the most difficult family of birds to identify. Uh, that may have something to do with um, uh, why they're my favorite family. Um, uh, I find them not that very difficult to, to identify but it's probably because I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so mudlark is a magpie lark? Correct. The, the many birds have mm. local names or um, uh, more than one common name. And um, uh, mudlark is another name for magpie lark. In South Australia, they call it the Murray magpie. So different parts of Australia have different common names to birds. Um, the um, Superb fairy wren is sometimes in the bush known as Mormon birds because it appears that it always has more females with the males than the males. Um, uh, yeah, so so there's a whole range of local names that uh, uh, the general public uses that bird watchers don't. Again, thank you for that. Uh, do you ever run tours of the Western treatment plant? Um, I do, yes, yep, yep. You can find them on uh, my we uh, website, Melbourne Birding Tours. You'll find uh, I have tours there. We might put that in the um, uh, in the follow up email as well. There's a lot of waders at the Western Treatment Plant, so if you're trying to identify them, you do need to know what you're looking at. Okay, thank you. So someone's written correction, the starling was in summer plumage as the beak is yellow. Well, the plumage was winter plumage, the, the feathering was winter plumage. Okay. Uh, someone's asked again, where can I connect with other people who are interested in bird watching in the Shire? Um, Birds Australia is a national bird watching organization throughout Australia and they do have branches scattered throughout um, the suburbs of Melbourne the closest one being uh, there's a Baldwin branch and also there's a branch at uh, Healesville so it's Birds Australia Healesville branch and there's also a Baldwin branch okay thank you um, what's the difference between a crow and a raven <laughs> I get asked that question all the time <laughs> and basically there is no difference. <clears throat> Technically ravens should have wedge shaped tails but um, ra ravens in Australia don't have so basically there's, there's no difference between 
Australian ravens and Australian crows. Um, they're really all crows. People are just correcting, saying that it's bird life. All right, bird, bird life. life Australia. I'm just going to write that down. Yeah, so it's Bird Life Australia, which is um, the app. Thank you for that. So, what's a good way to start bird watching with kids? Um, well, you you need to buy them their own binoculars. Um, uh, and buy them their own field guide, and, and so learn them, teach them how to to use a field guide. So when they see a bird, look at the plumage, try and remember as much as they can, and look at the book and and, uh, and try and put the two together. And uh, like like any young person, just praise them when they get it right, and help them uh, uh, when they don't get it right. Um, all my children were, um, I've got four children, they were all brought up as bird watchers from a very young age and uh, one of them uh, is still a, a very keen bird watcher. Uh, he's now an environmental consultant specialising in birds and uh, has a degree in zoology. So uh, I got one bird watcher, well one very keen bird watcher out of four children so that's not bad. I think that's pretty good, yes. Uh, so someone said uh, bird bass attracts birds quite well and would be good uh, for a camera setup. So whoever yeah. asked that question before. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, but, but if you put a, a bird bath out or, or, or uh, things for birds to drink from, um, you will attract more introduced species than native species, but, but still you're attracting birds into your garden. Yeah, yeah. Um, so someone said about, you know, speaking of um, as a child, make it fun, make sure they have a love from a young age. I'm the best birdie in my house. That's <laughs> it's, it's interesting that the best bird watchers started when they were young. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, but having said that, uh, there are a lot of birders I know who only started it once they retired, but are still very adequate birders. So you, you can start birding at, at any time in life, but um, the really, really good birders usually started when they were young. Yeah. So someone said that this has been a really great session and thank you very much, Chris. Um, what has been the most surprising bird to have seen in the Arrow Rangers? Ah, oh, right. That, that, that. Um, you, you get birds unexpectedly turning up in the Yarra Ranges. For, for example, um, one time I was birding at um, Badger Creek Weir, which is part of the Dandenong Ranges National Park, and I saw a, a, a channel-billed cuckoo flew, flew past me. So that's a bird that I, you wouldn't expect to see in Melbourne. Uh, so that, that surprised me greatly, but also I've been surprised this year by watching this um, uh, species of bird of prey nesting uh, within the, the suburbs of Melbourne, which has not been recorded before. Uh, um, yeah, so I mean, I'm constantly surprised of, of uh, things like um, uh, last year, I, I was sat at the traffic lights uh, on the outskirts of Melbourne, it, it, within the Shire, and uh, a Pacific coal flew past my car. That that surprised me. So uh, there are still uh, lots of surprises out there, even for uh, the most experienced bird watcher. Thank you for that. Um, someone said that they would love the next one to include bird calls too. So it looks like you'll be doing another one, Chris. <laughs> We've still got. I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to imitate bird calls. <laughs> uh, we've still got 49 questions. So, and it's almost. It's five to. Uh, it's 11:25. So maybe we'll do another five minutes. Um. So, what is the most uh, valuable, vulnerable species in the Shire, uh, and what are the environmental changes that could support their numbers? Mm. 
Well, a helmeted honeyeater, of course, is endangered, but it is, it is not a full species. It's only a subspecies of the yellow tufted honeyeater, but it's certainly um, a very endangered subspecies. Uh, powerful owls, obviously, are well represented in the Shire, but uh, it's also another species that's uh, uh, quite vulnerable, needs a, a large amount of territory to, uh, to raise a family of birds. Yep, thank you. Uh, I wear glasses, uh, multifocal. I find it very hard to use binoculars. Any tips, please, Chris? Um, binoculars these days are designed for spectacle wearers and non-spectacle wearers. So if you're a spectacle wearer, you turn the eye cups down. Uh, and, if, and if you're a non-spectacle wear, uh, wearer, you put the eye, make sure the eye cups are up. But um, I, um, I don't use spectacles for bird watching. I only use spectacles for, for reading. So I really uh, not too sure. I, I, I know uh, when I'm leading uh, bird watching tours that the, my clients wear, that wear spectacles uh, find it more difficult, uh, particularly when it's raining. Um, but um, I guess you, uh, you have no choice um, about it. Um, uh, if, if you're short-sighted, you're going to have to wear spectacles. And uh, I think it's just a matter of persisting with it and uh, uh, making sure you have a lens cloth to keep uh, dry, drying your spectacles if it rains. Thank you. Uh, there's just a few more quiet commentary on feeding birds. Uh, someone has said that um, lorikeets and other birds um, can spread virus uh, to other birds. So just make sure um, all your water bowls are cleaned regularly. Thank you for that. Um, a few other people have mentioned that too. Um, it's amazing how many people have asked <laughs> questions. It's crazy. Uh, what's the easiest way to record birds? <laughs> well, for, for years I carried a shotgun microphone uh, wherever I went and re recorded my own bird calls, made my own tapes of birds. Um, um, I, I, I think a shotgun microphone is still the, the easiest way to record bird sound. Uh, they're, they're quite inexpensive these days, uh, but as I say, it's so easy to download an app onto your telephone now that uh, most people don't uh, don't bother making their own sound recordings. But if you wanted to, a shotgun microphone would be the way to go. Yep, thank you. Uh, there's just a few more resources and stuff here that I might just um, put together later. So how can someone uh, discourage pigeons? Uh, from living and nesting, raising families in a small garden. Most of the cooing and more so. Keep, uh, shooing, keep shooing them away would be the best thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Yep. Um, I, think, I think maybe we might leave it there. Um, I know I haven't answered everyone's questions and there's still another 40 questions to go, but I'm conscious that people um, need to go because it's now 11.30. Um, so when we send our uh, follow-up email out in the next couple of days, um, I'll just encourage you just to email Chris any other questions that you might have um, and he'll be able to help you with that. Uh, and then we might also ask people if they, uh, you know, want to participate in a guided uh, bird tour, which would be fantastic. So just let us know if you're interested. By the way, if any of you photograph a bird, but you're not sure what it is, please feel free to email it to me and I'd be more than happy to identify it for you. Thank you for that. Um, I think also we might have to run another session, Chris. <laughs> the people are very interested in this. Um, so, you know, we'll just think about how we're going to run that. Um, 
and then you know more time for q a and that kind of stuff uh, but thank you so much chris that was really informative and wonderful and thank you everyone for participating and thank you for um, asking so many questions um, I really appreciate that. I think there might have been about 100 questions at one point. Wow. <laughs> so I'm sorry that I didn't get to yours. It was just a lot to kind of pour through them all. Um, but thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, so have a good rest of the, the day. See you later. Happy, happy birding. Happy birding. Thank you. See you later.